Imagine cities rolling out solutions to enhance culture, facilitate urban regeneration, promote public participation, and democratize public space. Diverse citizens helping to steer the human-friendly transformation of their towns, selectively using the most sustainable and sensible tech interventions to advance these goals. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by Daniel Latore, founder and director of The Wise City. Daniel is an advocate for digital placemaking with a focus on community engagement and for city leaders going beyond smart cities. Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And I'm sure most of our listeners have heard uh, some buzz around smart cities, but can you sort of start us out by telling us what a wise city might look like? Thank you for uh, inviting me. That is a really good question. The way that I like to explain it is when we think about the word smart and the way smart is used in contemporary culture, it can mean all sorts of things. And it usually doesn't include ethics or responsibility or compassion or sustainability. Maybe a little bit now with green tech and the environmental movement. And there's certainly a lot of technologists that think technology can solve our climate crisis. But that to me is the same mistake as thinking that technology alone and engineers and engineering can solve our rapidly urbanizing planet. I'm curious about sort of how you unpacked what smartness may lack. If you're looking at maybe a gap in ethics and compassion and possibly sustainability, how do you build that in with a wise city model? Yeah, so here's another more concrete example. A wise city would center people and places and the values that the community has at the center of their governance and the decision-making and planning process. Whereas a smart city centers the material or the stuff, like how are we going to build the seawall to solve the flooding? Not how can we get to the root of the climate crisis, but how can we just basically have everyone have more water filters and expensive mitigations through technology schemes that, of course, are very profitable. But in many cases, it's like putting your head in the sand. You're not really getting to the origin or the source or the underlying dysfunction of our modern philosophies. What do you mean by dysfunction? What do you think is dysfunctional about how we're doing these things now? I love to actually use the frame of functional and dysfunctional as opposed to natural and unnatural. So this is a perfect example of the philosophical roots of our situation. For most of at least Western modern theory and philosophy, humans have been designated as outside of nature, that we are not an animal, we are not part of nature, and nature is what is outside of cities or things. We've sort of deified or reified, quote unquote, nature, like undeveloped land, and then put everything else in this other category that assumes that we can completely control that. So there's this underlying assumption that nature and life is completely controllable, and we're also separate from it. And then if maybe we haven't done a good job of that, and it's been very dysfunctional, it's because we don't have enough data. Our simulators aren't accurate enough. The algorithm is wrong. It's not the fact that we're approaching the whole problem from a position of math, as opposed to a position of how does your heart feel? How does your body feel? in these different spaces when you're being treated in a different way because of the different policies are in effect. And here's the irony. We have more data than ever, but we also are in a profound series of a number of crises and longstanding unresolved crises around the environment, around racism, around economic equality and democracy. And so why is it that we have all this focus on STEM, 
science, technology, engineering, and math, and we've got all this data, and we've got more and more powerful computers, and yet it's almost like that's gotten worse because our focus is so, in my perspective, from a wisdom perspective, is our focus is entirely more and more caught up on the wrong things. It's just not black or white like that. Imagine if back in the day, people were coming from a more of a wisdom perspective and they saw the automobile for what it was, a super inefficient system compared to trains and trolleys and bicycles and something that wouldn't really scale. And they thought about the environmental and resource impacts and the secondary effects that lead to resource wars, part of which we're seeing right now as this is being recorded with the situation in Russia and Ukraine and they would have said, hey, this is actually a bad technology. Let's pass. Let's actually limit this or constrain it and heavily regulate it for industrial uses, for like delivery in its appropriate place. And instead, let's invest in trolleys, mass transit and trains and bicycle infrastructure instead of destroying them all or stopping the funding of them. Imagine what the world would be like if there was enough wisdom in place at the beginning of this problem because the automobile and the energy and resources that are part of that system are one of the largest dysfunctions the human species has ever made. Yeah, or even things like the idea that streets need to be three, four, or five lanes so that you can have multiple lanes of traffic plus parking on the side. I mean, it's like a whole other way of even physically structuring an urban or semi-urban environment. And it's kind of been getting worse now. You know, we were making headways, but as my former colleagues and friends who run the War on Cars podcast have been really good at pointing out is, you know, you have all these SUVs and pickup trucks now that are like militarized tanks. It's something to do, I think, with the crisis in white masculinity or whatever. It's like this <laughs> fear of like, oh my God, my privilege is being taken away. I don't know if there's been any studies on this, but I think it seems pretty clear what's driving all of that. One of the things that a lot of people around the world have been seeing over the last couple of decades, I guess, is just more surveillance and cameras and yeah. the city saying, well, this is going to keep us all safer and this is going to keep people from rolling through red lights and speeding down the roads and whatever. And when it happened here, it didn't feel like there was a choice point. There didn't feel like there was a point where we could say hey, I actually would rather not have surveillance in our city. We don't have those systems anymore, but it was post facto. They spent a lot of money. They put them up. You're talking about in Albuquerque. In Albuquerque, yeah. Red light cameras. And it was a third party, private party that was processing the video and issuing tickets to people. And, you know, it was very hard to fight the tickets because it wasn't even the city. But that was, you know, a smart solution that turned out to be an unwise solution. Let's touch on that a bit here. So it's the same thing as like, let's just build seawalls to protect us from flooding. It's this technological solution that does have some merit. There is evidence that it does reduce speeding in school zones and places where there's increased need for more care and caution in the relationship between drivers and people who are not surrounded by two tons of metal. However, I want to connect this back to the sort of functional and dysfunctional frame. There is something that's functioning there that is useful, but there's also a lot of things that are dysfunctional. The privatization of governance is a major problem. And it often isn't ever put up to any sort of elected or representative choice. And so we have to talk about the politics. We can't talk just about technology and sociology. Current American dominant way of neoliberalism, which assumes that government is bad and private companies are good, is a very dysfunctional politics and logic. There's some merit to it in certain cases, in certain ratios but in other domains where there's a tremendous need for equity and fairness, accountability, being responsible for the impacts of that shouldn't be left to the whims of a private company that has no political and electoral and democratic oversight. I think it's almost the notion of what we would call the public good. 
where a transcendent entity such as a government can take on the notion of what is in the interest of the public good versus what is in the interest of profitability, efficiency, and all those kind of things that come out of the private corporate world. And I also want to clarify that I really think it's also more useful to talk about governance. One of my mantras is that all technology is political. All human creation, anything that we do is political because there's power dynamics involved. There's privileges, there's different ratios of power and privilege because we are all in a relative order. We are not all in the same position in the same boat. We're in very different boats. The red light cameras, you know, there was a big scandal in Chicago where the private company that was managing their red light cameras, there were mysterious spikes in ticketing that the private company said, oh, it was a glitch. Once the Chicago Tribune did investigative journalism, looked at the data, and basically was doing governance as a journalistic institution because there was no oversight within city government. So the journalists uncovered this algorithmic juking of the system because the private company was paid a percentage of each ticket. So the whole incentives, kind of like our healthcare system, is we're incentivizing sickness, we're incentivizing dysfunction. Is that solving safer cities? No, it's profiting off of the unsafe system of the design of the street. The wiser approach or a more functional approach is let's change the design of the streets. I was at the front row of the Google smart city battle with the residents of Toronto in the Sidewalk Toronto smart city initiative that successfully resisted and was shut down. And I was even approached to work for Google Sidewalk program. And the job description for one of their positions was basically written based on my actual career, which the writer of that job description told me, you know, so there was this really uncanny irony where Google was looking at my career and thinking of it as a model for urban digital smart city leadership. I explored that with them and I said, hey, if you don't listen to the citizens and it's not authentic, in this day and age with the transparency of social media and the rapid organizing of social media, you can't pull a fast one through backroom deals. It's really hard to pull that off and it's wrong and it's just not authentic and that's not good for business. Even just on a single bottom line orientation, think about all the money, the lawyers and the talent, all of that money that was invested in that for what? to try to force some oligarch's vision of let's have our smart city, but let's do it right this time because we're smarter, because we have more data, because we have bigger computers. So again, it was that same logic of computation that was like, well, we just didn't get the algorithm right. Now we've got the smarter people and different people and we'll do it right because we're special because we have the special tech. Oh, the old tech was bad. So you know what would be better? Let's have new tech. And no one's questioning what Torontoans or Albuquerqueans, you know, need isn't more technology. What's our food system like? What's our climate mitigation system like? What's our equity in dealing with racial justice like? What are the real needs? Have we talked to them? Have we asked them? That's a much more functional conversation that leads to a wiser path. Part of the way that our current rhetoric about our political culture in the United States is, is that so many people don't realize that our cars the manufacture of the cars, the gasoline that goes into the cars, the asphalt that people drive on, the bridges that they go across are all subsidized. And so because it's so useful and valued, it's been taken for granted. Some of what you're describing, to me anyway, sounds like a particularly American problem, which is that whole notion of rugged individualism versus societal good. And it's actually exported. The influence of America is actually spreading this dysfunction. I got to meet Bianca Wiley, who is one of the many leaders in the resistance to the Google Sidewalk Smart City Project in Toronto. She has only grown. She came into this all kind of new to the whole urbanism and smart city debate. But as a democratic governance minded person has learned really fast and is working now in an academic capacity and public policy capacity and writing on this whole question of where is the democratic choice it's at procurement. 
where's the governance for how procurement happens? And there's many voices in the United States as well who also pointed out that we need to talk about how procurement happens and that as a intervention point for increasing democratic oversight for more functional outcomes. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Daniel, thank you for coming and talking with us about how citizens and people engaged in municipal governance can make better tech decisions. We've been talking about how leaders might make decisions at the procurement point. And I guess in my head, I imagine that I'm a city leader and somebody comes to me and says, I've got the solution to your homelessness problem, or I've got the solution to your traffic problem or your transportation gridlock that you have across the city. And it's this wonderful tech package that I've engineered for you. And it may seem really easy to just say, okay, yes, the citizens want better traffic flow through the city. So here's my one stop solution. So at that point, what can leaders do to sort of put the brakes on that technical acceleration? How can they hear from other people who might have different solutions, even non tech solutions? So this is happening not just in the U.S., but everywhere. You know, the work that I've done, especially during the pandemic, brought me to various places in Europe. I was able to do a project in Colombia, where I was originally born, and spent several months in Australia and visited many cities, giving talks and workshops and working on a couple projects. It's everywhere. So this dilemma of the sort of breathless jump on the tech bandwagon, tech will save you, tech has all the answers. If you don't get in now, you'll be a loser, you won't get elected, or you you won't make as much impact. There's a ton of PR and marketing pressure that is wrapped up in this whole idea of technological determinism, which is that whatever Silicon Valley is planning is inevitable. You have no choice. But to start submitting to this regime now or later when it's too late and maybe you won't benefit or your residents benefit as much because you won't be in power or you won't have a job because you didn't learn all the fancy new technology that's going to save us. And then also because of the climate crisis and all these other issues politically going on, it's like, oh, well, the answer is not only that technology will save us, but we need to do as much technology as soon as possible. Don't ask why. Don't ask silly questions. Trust the engineers. Trust the VCs that they know best for the entire planet. That right there is incredibly dysfunctional because it doesn't allow space for a representative democratic mix of people to weigh in on, is that true? Is there evidence for this? Is this even the conversation we should be having right now? Are there other more important conversations that we should be having? Are there a tremendous amount of negative impacts or costs or externalities that will result from this path of technology in this particular case? What sort of disruptions to good things will be happening because we're focusing on this and not something else? There's a whole number of what I would consider very wise questions to ask that have been 
developed in a number of different disciplines outside of engineering culture, in sociology, in the humanities, anthropology, the history of science, history of science and technology, science and technology studies, communication studies, et cetera. And even in journalism, there's a growing amount of critical journalism happening in communications about the impact of the way that our communication systems are actually affecting our decision-making and our ability to understand each other. There's a lot of very important contexts that need to go into the decision-making, and it is unfair to expect that any one local leader, whether it's a career professional or an elected official, or even a local community organizer, any one person can't understand and be able to speak to all of this. You need a collective cross-disciplinary group of people, you know, sort of the wisdom of the crowd, which at one point got a lot of buzz around this whole idea of wisdom of crowds. And it's, again, not the silver bullet answer to everything either, because we do need experts. We do need professionals who have deep knowledge and experience in what they are doing. But we need to listen to everybody. We need everyone's input in order to make this really equitable and functional. Can I ask, Daniel, and this is me playing a little bit of devil's advocate. There's an aspect here to what you're saying, which is there's almost a presumption that given the opportunity, people will be engaged and vocal and speak their mind. And if this comes off as cynical, forgive me, but in practice, it seems like when it comes to governance, that people only get vocal when it's something that hits really close to home. We can talk about the dysfunction of having all our cities centered around the automobile, but people only really think about it when the kid gets hit by a speeding car in the school zone. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, we need to reconfigure the streets or we need to do this or we need to do that. This question is really important. It shines a light on one of the sort of important mirrors that we need to hold up and look at American culture. What is our culture right now? Our political culture, our, our justice culture, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a question. Can we actually look in the mirror and see ourselves? Do we have the courage and the wisdom to say, hey, it's really important right now to have an honest reflection of where we are and who we are, who's not in the mirror, who is in the mirror? In particular, again, we have to talk about the politics. So back to you know what I mentioned previously is that all technology is political because it's made by humans and all humans have different power relations. So there is always politics. And what I mean in politics, I don't mean electoral politics. I mean more than that. I mean power. There are power relations. That's what politics is about, is the, the sharing and negotiation of our power, because we're all powerful people. We don't even realize that, but we all have a certain amount of power. This idea of a participatory democracy, which is very American and very individualistic, and I would say now kind of wrapped up in a lot of libertarianism, which is this assumption that everyone is equal. And so everyone will be able to vote and distributed organizations and distributed systems on their own are somehow democratic is frankly because we do not have the same power relationships. If we go down a path of just getting rid of formal governance and just letting everything be completely free market laissez-faire, the people who will take advantage of that environment are the people with the most amount of power. And that's basically called feudalism. Well, it's the same people driving that deterministic narrative you were talking about. Exactly. Curious, that's who's driving that narrative, right? You know, who benefits from each different position? Like, that's an important, wise question. Well, who will benefit from this path? And who won't benefit? Who will be excluded? And so, yeah, Craig, the reality is I may be really available for being involved in community activism and real participatory democracy. But if I have a child in nine months and I need to be co-parenting, I'm not going to be able to be going to all the meetings. And it's not because I don't care. It's because I have other priorities. And life is like that because we're alive and powerful and we're constantly moving and creating and shifting in different ways. If I become sick because I don't have health insurance, right, and I can't take care of myself and I'm struggling, if I need mental health assistance, you know, it's all these other needs and things that happen to us in life that you can't count on, which is why representative democracy was one of the things that we've arrived at, is it's important to delegate decision-making 
there is some really innovative ideas that's kind of in the in-between zone here of these ideas of liquid democracy. What if there is technology can help us in a more free flowing delegation of who do we deem the experts to be involved in different decision making? That's come out of some of the political parties in Europe and in Latin America. The other thing is we haven't figured it out, right? So democracy is relatively new and it's been resisted as soon as it was created in Greece. And it's an ongoing thing. That itself is an area of innovation. We're like, what if we reframe the whole thing of that? This isn't about technology. We should be glorifying the innovators and leaders in a more functional or wiser form of governance. The whole spectrum, informally, from the personal to the family, to the community, to the city, region, and beyond, right? Globally. How do we all live together in our neighborhood? How do we live together in our cities? How do we live together on this planet? That perspective, those questions, that to me is innovation. And part of that, a small part of that, maybe 10% technology can help. It's something more like that's the ratio that is a wise ratio versus ignoring all of these questions, ignoring all of these feelings, ignoring all these people and thinking that the main gap in our world is our technology and the type of currency that we have. Can you point to any positive functional examples? Yeah. Here's the thing about embodiment. I want to kind of talk about how do we get out of our heads and be more grounded and embodied and holistic in our way that we show up in the world as community members, as members of interconnected, responsible adults. I really want to give a shout out to what Francesca Bria is doing in Barcelona and what the city of Barcelona is doing in their technology policy, which is filled with the sociological and cultural consciousness and history awareness of these choices and is very much in this spirit. I mean, frankly, the answers are it's not happening in the United States because even the civic technology or public interest technology that is these sort of movements that are happening in the US, which is good. It's like E for effort, but it's so often filled with a lot of individualistic libertarian ethos because that's just the waters that we're swimming in here. I would say there are some new programs and new places at Yale and Harvard, you know, so there are some beachheads. There are some places now where there are new next gen folks that are coming from this consciousness in the United States. And like I mentioned in Toronto with uh, Bianca Wiley and the work that's happening out of that kind of movement, because they just were energized by encountering the Smart City project and resisting it successfully. That energized them now. So there's a lot more happening there. And then also in Amsterdam, actually, before the pandemic, I was there for a placemaking conference with Project for Public Spaces and Placemaking X, which is another group that grew out of Project for Public Spaces and got to actually go and teach at a university there to future digital placemakers or urban technology type folks. And what I was hearing there, what was being taught, was this more holistic. So in Europe, and I think, again, this is the context, is a lot of the European democracies are much more socially oriented. They're not individualistic compared to the United States. They have a broader social contract. They have a relatively more inclusive mission at hand, still fraught with problems with racism and other things and their own battles with the for-profit mentality versus a more equitable approach. It would be better if local uh, officials that are really interested in this, if they went and visited and talked with folks in Barcelona or Amsterdam, I would say, than to talk to anyone in the United States. Now, I'm saying that in a very provocative way because I want to get people's attention on this. There are folks in, I would say, look under public interest as the hashtag and the responsible technology and ethical technology, which itself is a bit fraught because that space is also filled with a lot of corporate players that are looking to basically do the same thing they've always been doing, but tokenistically making it look like they're being ethical and responsible, but they're not really changing the game at all. There's been a lot of people who've been fired or have quit the big tech companies that were claiming to do ethical technology because they couldn't handle the mirror of an accurate accounting and reflection of how artificial intelligence and other tech savior-like ideas 
are actually just exacerbating racism and misogyny and other sorts of problems because they just were never thinking about that when they were making it. And there's also a presumption that they could fix it. And there's a really good argument that there's a lot of cases where AI should just never even be used because the problem at root and the solution path forward is not an algorithm, period. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Daniel, thank you so much for talking with us today about the next frontier in municipal governance. I wanted to pick up on the notion of placemaking and the notion of digital placemaking. So can you describe that for us, what placemaking is all about? You know, you read my mind. I actually wanted to talk about this. Yeah. So let me give you my favorite definition of placemaking, just kind of set a baseline. As we know it, it was basically this approach to a community-oriented urban planning and design started in the 70s, kind of connected to Jane Jacobs and connected to the resistance to the growth of automobiles and freeways and how cities were being gutted and affected, you know, neighborhoods and communities were being negatively affected by this future technology, the car that was promised to liberate us. And so there's a nonprofit was started around then by Fred Kent called Project for Public Spaces, a nonprofit that practiced what it preached. So the evolution of placemaking has been very much defined by all of the different community oriented collaborative projects that it has been involved in and the dialogue with all the other similar institutions in the world, in Europe and in Australia and Canada and South America and other places. Project for Public Spaces is kind of like the founding place where it happened. And they have many definitions of it themselves because it's a very organic thing. But the one that I like is this. Placemaking is a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. More than just promoting better urban design, placemaking facilitates creative patterns of use, paying particular attention to the physical, cultural, and social identities that define a place and support its ongoing evolution. So my joke in a sense is that digital placemaking is the appropriate use of digital technology to authentically support and practice this ongoing evolutionary practice that's called placemaking. What digital placemaking isn't, because there's a lot of people that take that digital technological determinism and reductionism, and they think, oh, if I'm using technology in public space, it's digital placemaking. That is inauthentic to the history and the tradition and the politics and the origin of placemaking. So I always like it again to go back to, is it authentic? Is it connected to the actual movements and people and communities and the history and the origin of it? And is it in alignment with that? You know, so a lot of cities now you'll see instead of billboards or just signage in a bus shelter or neighborhood, you'll see these digital screens, these urban screens, as they're called. And they're basically the way I like to think of them from a digital placing perspective is that they're not digital placemaking. They are basically banner ads in your city that are like permanently installed banner ads that you can't install an ad blocker to remove because a private contract was made through a procurement process that usually went through no democratic oversight or public buy-in and support or vote on. Can I ask though, Daniel, so I get what you're saying, but what would a positive or functional example look like? So I've actually created a guideline 
that allows people to determine whether or not they're doing digital placemaking. Because I don't have the answer about what you should be doing in Albuquerque or any other city on the planet. What's important is what is the underlying approach that is a wiser, more functional approach. It really needs to be connected to the community's goals and needs. So I have a bunch of questions that I've put together, 14 of them actually. That's a way to kind of assess, you kind of like score, is your project digital placemaking? And I'll just mention some of them. One of the number one question is, you know, what problem is it actually solving? That digital solution, okay? That often itself isn't made clear. So question two, whose problem is it? Is it just people who are really wealthy and well off? Is it only for the business community, et cetera? That alone then also unravels it a bit more. Question three would be, what people or institutions might most seriously be harmed by that technological solution? Because I don't need to ask you what are the benefits because you're going to have all this PR and marketing telling you with this technology, you will get X, Y, and Z and everything will be happy. And so there's no lack of the claims on the benefits and they're not all wrong, but what is completely missing is the critical stuff. So any of us that are involved in the skepticism and critique of technological determinism and technological accelerationism are often met with this question of, well, you're just being a naysayer. Why don't you do something positive? You know, well, what do you really want? That presumes the same logic that they're pushing, which is that a single person or entity can tell everyone else in the world what is the answer. That's a reductionist approach that assumes by definition very limited amounts of information and oftentimes not the whole picture, but a reduced superficial understanding can have the answer for everybody else. So that's what I mean where I'm always wanting to kind of take a question like you asked and then get to the underlying dysfunction that we just are sort of swimming in, right? It's like we're swimming in these toxic waters and we don't even know how to necessarily get out of it. A lot of the work that I do is more about asking questions and encouraging dialogue rather than saying, forget this answer, here's my solution, you know? It's really like that joke about science teaches us how to clone dinosaurs and humanities teaches us whether we should clone dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is the engineering logic. The engineering culture and everything like this that is part of STEM does not really focus on why. And the morality and the ethics and philosophy and the end goal or if it does, it's in a really reductionist manner. Like why? Because of profit. Why? Because I want my Lexus. Questions that I come at, like the ones that I just mentioned, are coming from the practice in the field of media ecology. And that came from Marshall McLuhan. Um, he's kind of the father of media ecology, which is understanding mediums or media as environments. So if you think about any radio, TV, film, the internet, podcasting, etc., these all create different social relations and different mental states because it's like you're smelling, you're tasting, you're drinking, you're smoking different substances, and they create different realities, right? So it's like the difference between smoking pot and drinking a beer. Those create different vibes. And it's the same thing with different technologies, right? And so in this day and age, in 2022, I feel like that's a really fair comparison to make that a lot of people will understand, even if they won't admit it, you know? <laughs> So let me give you some of the other questions that are more coming from the placemaking culture and the work that I've been doing. Going back to this project that you have in mind in any city or that you dream of, or if you're an official working on a project right now, is it contextual to the place? Or is it a solution that was for somewhere else? And it's like, well, that looked cool and fancy. Let's have that in our local public park or street. Are local people involved in making and using it in the definition of it, right? In the RFP, if you will. Does it support a human scale relationship or interaction? That's a really important term in placemaking and in anthropology and sociology as well as this idea of human scale. Is it relatable at a human level? Does it increase the feeling of human connection or the connection with other animals, the birds, pets, dogs, or whatever, right? Does it increase that sense of connection or does it increase separation? So if you think about a gigantic church or a gigantic skyscraper, that is an anti-human scale relationship that by design is meant to impose and kind of install like fear or reverence about how tiny and unimportant you are compared to a bank or religion. And depending on how that's being used could be good or bad, but you can't escape from the fact that it's not human scale 
versus sitting around in a park with some movable seating and you can rearrange the seating to sit in a circle and watch your kids play or have a picnic. That's human scale. So the digital technology, is it increasing that sense of connection of how can I turn strangers in my neighborhood into friends or at least acquaintances that I respect? Or is the technology alienating and only exacerbating the way that I am objectifying other people? I live on a dead end street. I've never lived on a dead end street before. And I have been pleasantly surprised at how the dead end has changed the way that my little neighborhood feels. And it makes for a very communal kind of interaction. For me, it's been kind of life-changing and astonishing just to have that kind of connection with the people that I actually live next to. Does it increase face-to-face -face interaction? So in this case, because that dead end, which itself is a term that is defining that space from the technology, from the technology of the car's perspective, it's a dead end. But if you think about that from a human scale perspective, what would we call that instead? Cul-de-sac, uh, pod, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right? There's, there could be something much more positive. Right. My own nomenclature is thinking about it from the perspective of the car, which is I can't keep driving. So Daniel, could you tell us some examples of um, some of the projects you've worked on or seen where they do positively and constructively answer some of these questions of increasing face-to-face -face interaction or supporting human scale relationships? So much of the work that placemaking is about in general is about basically doing capacity building. Because sometimes you encounter projects in cities where the community infrastructure is very high. There's lots of robust, actively engaged community groups. There are local elected officials and institutions that are responsive to their communities and constantly seeking their input and understanding the contexts, the ever-changing contexts of their places. But unfortunately, that is, I would say, more the exception to the rule, which is there's a lot of cities where people are very alienated. There's very little community organizing happening. There's very poor representative governance on the electoral or career institutional side. And everyone's just kind of all off in their silos, you know, their houses, they're all in their various castles and cathedrals, all isolated and separate. And that never leads to a good place, which is usually then there's a major problem and someone is like, let's try this placemaking approach. In the past 15 years, it's like, how can we use all of this fancy technology to actually maybe help this be better? So a lot of the work that I've done has been around using the digital technology for the community organizing. So that's a big component of it is the sort of social media weaving in good digital community organizing to marry that really well with the in-person community organizing. And you need both. That would also kind of inoculate your project from saying, let's replace all of this community organizing and all of this in-person stuff with technology, because that does not lead to a good place. So the questions apply to the process too, as well as to the product. Exactly. This is a big thing right now in technology itself, right? So in the world of software and design and technology, the smarter and wiser creators realize that we really need to focus on outcomes, not features. Because the feature always has an assumption of an outcome. This is the reason why so many pieces of technology, whether it's a car or a building or an automated water faucet or an app, just doesn't work or works really horribly because they built the feature, right? So the engineers were like, well, does it do X, Y, or Z? Yes. Did they test it? Did they test it with everybody? Did they continue to look at feedback to find out, is it actually generating the assumed result? So that goes back to question number one, what is the problem that this technology is a solution for and whose problem is it and who might be harmed by this and what new problems might be created Let's say the technology does solve this problem and it doesn't create any additional harms, but it actually creates a new problem. You know, if you think about all of the video game technology, from a STEM perspective, there's a lot of people like, yeah, all this technology, iPad, apps, all this thing, brain games. How do we get young Einstein kids to be smarter? Because if they don't, they're going to fail. And there's this anxiety. There's this profound anxiety that the technological determinism has been created. But meanwhile, we have an epidemic of sedentary childhood obesity and diabetes. 
And was that ever examined in terms of the whole approach to the way that we center technology in our schooling and education system? You know, because I also worked in educational technology at Scholastic for several years before I got into placemaking and urban planning and architecture. So I got to see the logic and culture of educational technology in the for-profit space. Which has also pushed the same way and unquestioned the same way. I think increasingly people are willing to question it, but I know anecdotally it's much easier to accept people's pre-digested packages for your classroom than to try and come up with the same level of creative solutions as an individual. My approach is user-centered, customer-centered, human-centered design is one of the methods that is a wiser method. It's not the only solution. It is not enough on its own. So any of the people that are focusing on design thinking and human-centered design, and they think of that as the silver bullet, it's like, don't listen to the engineers, listen to the designers who are doing human-centered design. Well, you're just, again, replacing the same sort of determinism and solutionism, and it's just too narrow because they're not thinking about this humanities layer. What's the symbolic and cultural dimension of what does this mean? How is this going to affect people of different cultures and faiths? How will they receive it? All these other concerns are just never talked about because all of the oxygen in the room is being sucked up by these technological cheerleaders that think that's the only problem in the world or the only solution forward. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Daniel, thank you so much for being with us today. Most likely in your junior year of high school, you didn't have a teacher that said, hey, I think you have a great mind for digital placemaking. So what was your path that brought you to this work? How did you end up winding your way towards these particular efforts and intellectual inquiries? So I grew up in a multicultural, multiracial, you could say, household where, you know, my father is mestizo Colombian. I was born in Bogota in the center of the city in the Andes Mountains at 2,600 meters. Then we moved to the U.S. because my mother is Norwegian American from northern Minnesota, from a small town. And I grew up in a very high contrast multicultural family. Those are two very different cultures. So then we ended up moving to San Diego. And so it was like in the hills, you know, what to me felt like lots of hiking and walking and picnicking in the hills, or but also a lot of time on the beach. Then we ended up moving to Minneapolis because my mother's side of the family were a species that is in the process of urbanizing. Being very conscious of this, you know, is kind of what made me realize, well, why am I doing this work? And I think it's because I experienced really good urban culture, which is Bogota, like a very vibrant, very social urban city. And then the more, not rural, but very environmentally connected, very earthy, connected life. Like edge of the wilderness kind of thing. Yeah. And then Minneapolis was like suburban Minneapolis, tract housing, like the quote unquote American dream, which to me was very alienating being this international Latino kid. I was so alienated and dejected. I got into punk rock and like the art scene. Because it spoke to this affection and this, like, wait a minute, this is not quite right. This dream is, is actually a dystopia. So I was politically active as I became an individual in the world in high school. There was the Reagan and Bush in the United States and then the first Iraq war. And because of that, being in a multilingual, multicultural family, I always kind of gravitated towards the arts and culture or what you consider be part of the realm of the humanities. 
Like I was really into creative writing and ceramics and photography. And my idea at the time was actually communications. To me, there's a very consistent thread. And part of that was being in a house with parents who communicate very differently. I was like, how do we all get along? Because things that are lost in translation within a family, let alone within a neighborhood, within a city, state, country, planet. So I felt that very much at the time. And that was like, well, I want to get good at communications. And now there's this TV and video. And that was before the internet, really. There was just message boards on a modem back then. And I had an uncle who was in software. So I have to give credit to my uncle who was a computer programmer and taught me how to program in basic because he was like, this is the future. And I was kind of like an engineering tinkerer kind of kid in addition to being like an artsy kid. I think maybe because of this multicultural upbringing, I wasn't raised with specialist mentality. Like you must specialize and narrow. My father writes poetry and, and likes to draw. When I was a kid, so I'd see him drawing. I'd see my parents reading all the time and debating about the news and, and what do words mean because my father was wanting to understand English the vocabulary. So then when I started a university, I was at University of Minnesota where they had Gopher, which was like a pre-web technology. And I was like, this is amazing. This is fascinating. My initial interest was film studies and then media studies. So when the first web browser came out, I was like, oh, so basically this is a global montage where anybody can link to anybody else's image to tell visual storytelling in a living, ever-changing montage. I'm like, this is bigger than the printing press. This is going to change everything. I want to be involved in whatever that is. And so I taught myself how to program. Because thanks to my uncle, I already had that confidence and that familiarity. And HTML back then was just like peanuts, you know? So then that was it. So it was like this web thing and the politics around that. Because by then I was studying cultural studies and anthropology and with a sort of media studies focus in an interdisciplinary program at the University of Minnesota. And we had the University of Minnesota Press, which is huge. So I had found myself in a very special situation. My professor, my mentor that I found after interviewing all of the professors in the cultural studies department, Harvey Sarles, who is an anthropologist in the American descriptive linguistic tradition, which has become one of the disciplines that got blown out by computation and computational linguistics and then technology. Now, thankfully, I would say there's a resurgence in the significance of sociology and anthropology. So then I got a job and I ended up moving to New York and was part of the dot-com explosion in the 90s and that circus of techno-determinism and, and utopianism that I was a part of and benefiting from and kind of, I would say, lost a bit of consciousness from because the money was easy. I was in my 20s and you had all this talk about the end of history, you know, Fukuyama. Then the most important thing of this sort of origin story to tell you is 9-11. So 9-11 happened and it changed my life on every single level. And it made me say, I need to use all this talent that I have, whatever little amount of privilege that I have as a mixed Latino working class, middle class origin kid with no trust fund, with no safety net, living in a country that doesn't offer a safety net. But I would rather choose to put my talent and effort towards helping make the world be a better place. And actually so, not just in ways that I think and that my ego makes me feel good, did my life make this world a little bit better in some way? That's my underlying motivation. That's what led me to educational technology. And then when I saw all the bike lanes being painted in New York City, I was like, that's interface design. They're changing the interface. What do you mean the bike lanes being painted? Well, you know, here in New York, they started before they built physically separated bike lanes. They just painted green paint on the side of the road to mark this is a space for bikes. And because interface design, like the way we design our apps matters. And so cars wouldn't drive on that area. And there was an affordance for my safety that having ridden a bicycle in New York before that, it was like a extreme sport. And I stopped riding a bicycle because it felt so unsafe because the drivers were so aggressive. It was their space. So the simple act of changing the visual physical interface of the street and the profound feeling in my body, bringing it back to embodiment was like my body felt safer. My nervous system was not under threat as much. That was the big aha moment. If we can change where we live, I'd rather use my digital talents to advancing offline benefit rather than the fantasy of a metaverse or some virtual happiness. 
when you take material changes and you're talking about the material change in the equity materially of how cities are divided and allocated for different people for more uses, that to me is way more powerful. And I still think the entire technology culture space and the technical, critical, responsible, ethical technology space, if you're still only focusing on the technology itself and you're not looking at the offline impact of that technology, the material culture, you are, I would say, still on the wrong path. I offer this story because I want to inspire anyone else who may be in similar situations. Like you said, there's a deterministic aspect where we feel like this is inevitable and what are we even going to do about it if Silicon Valley wants to have an AI do all the hiring and firing for the city, who are we to argue and how can we argue and what's even wrong with that? Because I don't know. It seems like part of what you're doing is presenting a model of inquiry and criticism. Anybody can use the model to engage on the topics that matter to them locally, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the bulk of my work has been a mixture of training and capacity building. And that's what a lot of placemaking work is, is we come in and do like demonstration projects, but it's about training the trainers and in building the capacity to then make that your own, right? So what is placemaking and digital placemaking look like in Albuquerque or any other city should by definition be contextual to the inclusive pluralistic needs of the ongoing ever-changing placeness, right? And then I also do product consulting. So I am hired to help actually lead the development and definition and design of products and build product teams to actually make things happening. So for example, right now, I'm working with a startup that is sort of social impact oriented startup that wants to make technology better for older adults, which is the fastest growing demographic. We're all living longer and totally neglected because all this software is not made for them in mind. What does that offer us? What does that mean if we have more older folks? And age doesn't necessarily guarantee wisdom, but it definitely has the capacity for deeper reflection and historical oral traditions and truth telling about where we've been. But all of these sorts of things, these cultural dynamics in the question of how we use technology or what should technology be for, it's like uncharted territory. And to me, there is like an ethical need and benefit or import to this sort of thinking about the culture in time space. Because right now, so much of our technology and all of the focus is on the youth, right? Technology for the innovation is coming from the young kids and TikTok and blah, blah, blah. So there is already kind of acknowledgement that the young users are leading to innovative ideas or experimental directions that aren't being thought of because they've grown up immersed in that media ecology. I mean, and that really gives me a lot of pause because it's like the technology that we currently have in our society as dominated and largely defined and dictated by Silicon Valley libertarians is toxic by and large. I am not wanting to offer any sort of easy answer about the future, but I do believe from what I am seeing in every generation right now is there are more people than ever that are wanting to ask or face the difficult questions. If you think about the debates right now with critical race theory and like having our actual education system be a truer representation of our history, because absolute truth is not possible, but that doesn't mean it's all relative, right? So there are these movements that are happening in the environmental movement, in the racial justice movement, in the feminist movement, in the economic justice movements. There's all these small and large organizing efforts that are happening that are growing in momentum, but because they're coming from, I would say, a much more grounded and pluralistic perspective, it is not offering easy answers. It's a multilateral mosaic of many impacts and so what I would offer to listeners is get involved, is organize and connect. And there are people that are looking for that and none of us can go through this alone. That's the only way we're going to get through this is together. This whole idea that we're polarized to me is a whole other thing that I question. I, d I don't believe that that is an accurate framing of what's going on. Daniel, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, a lot of gratitude here as well. And if you would like more information about Daniel and his work, you can visit thewisecity.org. That's all one word, no spaces, thewisecity.org. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.